Lucia, Jacinto, and Francisco were children from the ages of seven to 10 during the time of World War I. They were out tending to the sheep and they had been distracted by a game of collecting rocks to see who could uh, create the tallest castle um, of the three of them. As they were starting to stack their rocks, suddenly a great jettison of light fell from the sky right above them. This panicked them, obviously, it would panic me. They scurried, they ran, they started to run home as another beam of light came, channeled down from the heavens and landed above an old oak tree near their path. This time, though, they stopped. They slowed down. They walked over to the tree. And there at the tree, they claimed to have seen an apparition or a spirit-like manifestation of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Young Lucia described it in this way. It was a lady dressed all in white, more brilliant than the sun, shedding rays of light, clear and stronger than a crystal glass, filled with the most sparkling water, pierced by the burning rays of the sun. This first apparition took place May 13th of 1917, near, here's your quiz for the morning, where? Do you remember this story? Near Fatima, Portugal. March 13th, 1917, it's become known as the miracle of Fatima. The spirit instructed them to return on the 13th of each month for the next five months. So six total, this one and five more. On the 13th of every month, same place, same time, that she would come and meet with them each time at this tree. She also said that there would be a seventh time afterwards. Did not give a time. Uh, did give a place that it would be here at this same tree. But at some time in the future, after those first six, there would be a seventh visit. She told them that if they were to, were, were to pray the rosary every single day, even if they face great trials and troubles over these meetings, if they pray the rosary every day, that she would reward the world with peace, that there would be a sign that would bring the entire planet to a peace. So, fast forward a month. The 13th of June came up. The children were excited. They were waiting. They had told a few people in their family about what they had seen in May. Some of them thought they were crazy. Some of them thought this is just little kids telling tales. Some of them were curious. And so as the 13th came up, the children ran to the oak tree to be there at the exact same time that they had been told to be there. Some family members came as well, but stood afar off. They stood in some brush um, away from this tree. And just at the time expected, another large flash came from the sky and the children were waiting for it at the tree. After instructing them how to pray more earnestly, the spirit spoke to Lysia with a special message. She made a promise or a prediction, a proclamation that her cousins, Jacinto and Francisco, would die soon but that Lucia would live a long, vital life in order to spread the gospel about Mary. Lucia was worried. She was scared. She didn't want to lose her cousins. She proclaimed her, her worry to, to this spirit. And the spirit said this, quote, I will never leave you. My immaculate heart will be your refuge and the way that will lead you to God. From this point on, the teaching at the tree was about the heart of Mary. Each meeting after this, she specifies that she will lead the world to peace 
if they follow the directions of her heart. If you do what I say, if you follow my directions, I will bring great peace. At this point, a bright light shone over Jacinto and Francisco, but the light was moving upward. At the same time, a great light shone upon Lucia, but the light pointed downward. And this was interpreted by the crowd who saw the light that that the prophecy of what she just of, of the prophecy that she just said that they would soon ascend to heaven and but Lucia would be um, glorified here on the earth. Those in attendance said that they did not see a spirit, they did not hear a voice, but they did see the light. They did hear the light, and they saw a cloud descend from the sky, hover over the oak, and then ascend when it was over. Fast forward another month. In July, just at the time it was supposed to, on the 13th, at the exact hour, another crowd had assembled. A crowd much larger than the last crowd. Because now they had the attention. Now there were other witnesses who had seen something and word began to spread. A larger crowd stood by in the same brush. The three children walked forward to the oak tree. The crowd reports hearing a loud humming sound as they again watched a cloud descend from heaven and hover over the oak tree. The children asked the spirit for a miracle. They wanted confirmation. They wanted evidence that what they were seeing was true and, and of God. The Spirit told them, if you continue to meet with me on the 13th of every month in October during the sixth meeting, I will grant a huge miracle, one that the entire world will see. During this apparition, the spirit suddenly opened her hands and opened the, the ground beneath the children. They looked down into the hole where they saw sinners burning. And the apparition told them, if people will do what I instruct you, if people do what I tell you, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. The war is going to end. This is World War I, of course, remember. I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my immaculate heart, she says. If not, if Russia is not consecrated to my heart, if not, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, promoting wars and persecutions in the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will suffer. Various, various nations will be annihilated. In the end, though, my immaculate heart will triumph. In our next part, in two weeks, we're going to discuss this part of the prophecy dealing with Russia. A lot of it's coming true. A lot of it came true right after that. A lot of issues with Russia, and it deals specifically with American politics. Uh, politics. But for now, I want you to catch the first part of what she said there. If you do what I instruct, I will bring great peace. That line may sound very familiar to you. I hope it sounds very familiar to you. It's the exact line I told you to remember last week. I won't ask for a show of hands because I know, like me, we're all old and we're all forgetful anyway. But I said, don't forget this line. If you follow my directions, there will be peace. You remember that in May, on May 14th of this year, the Global Compact on Education is going to take place in Rome. And if we take a look at the invitation of Pope Francis for, remember, world leaders, political leaders, religious leaders, Deans, presidents of universities, teachers and students, he's inviting to this global compact. You remember how we summed up his invitation? If you do what I say, what we instruct, there will be what? Peace in the world. 
same message, the Global Compact on Education in May, same message of Fatima, and it was the same message from part one of this series, the same message Pope Francis delivered to our lawmakers in September of 2015. If you do what I say, there will be great peace. Did our secular nation do what he said? No. And in 2016, we saw our nation rip in half, right? Almost in terms of like the, the Civil War. Our nation is divided. Okay, back to the story. The crowd again says that they saw the cloud and they heard the cloud, but did not see the apparition. The fourth apparition wasn't exactly as it was supposed to happen. You see, in the village, there were some powerful men who did not like that people were turning their hearts back to righteousness. People were committing their lives back to the church. The bars, for example, were empty. Some of the illegal crimes and things that were helping these men make money were ceasing because people were, were wanting to know if, if Mary was going to come back and they wanted great things to happen, so they were turning from their sins. One of these men who did not like what was happening, who was publicly persecuting the children and, and denying what they were saying, actually kidnapped the three children on the 13th that morning. He took them. The crowd did not know this. They still assembled at the oak tree. They were looking and wondering where the children were. The crowd says, they all report, that a cloud again came down over the oak tree. It hovered for a minute or two, and then it went back into the heavens because the children were not there. Six days later, this man, happy with what he had done, happy that he'd ended these apparitions, let the children go. And on August 19th, six days late, they were walking home from his house, and there on that road, another apparition of Mary took place, the fourth one. The Spirit told them this time that because she had been disobeyed, because the children did not meet with her on the 13th, that she would still perform a great sign during the sixth one in October, but it would not be one that the whole world would see. It would not be one that would bring great peace. She said it would be a lesser miracle that would take place in October. She went on to explain that Joseph, carrying a baby Jesus, would appear in the sky in October. That that was the miracle she would now perform. That Joseph, carrying a baby Jesus, would appear in the sky. September 13th came, the fifth apparition. The children were not kidnapped this time. They were back at the tree on the 13th at the given time. People now in the brush and around the tree now numbered in the thousands. Many thousands had now come to see what everyone was talking about. There were even in the crowd some men who came to mock. These men sat in a tree, another tree. They sat in a tree and they made fun of everybody who was there. They called the children names. They were screaming at them as they walked towards the tree, the oak tree. However, when the children arrived at the tree, there was a loud boom. The men said there was an explosion in the sky and they saw the great light channeling down to the tree. They watched the cloud uh, descend over the tree and hover. These men would never mock this again. They became believers. The spirit, after speaking to the children, went back into the sky. The crowd said they watched the cloud go back into the vastness of space. And now everyone was excited. The news had spread to multiple villages there in Portugal. Everyone couldn't wait for October 13th. When October 13th came, it was a day full of heavy rain. People were all standing in a soaked um, meadow around this tree. They all had umbrellas. The sky was almost black. It was dark. Yet, 70,000 people were there on October 13th. This time, however, 
The cloud did not descend at the exact time. The cloud waited for a few minutes. Catholicism calls this a tarrying time where people's faith were tested. And just at the moment that the priest, who was, who was technically a non-believer, he didn't believe these things that were going on. Even though the church um, was accepting these things, the priest did not. And he found this tarrying time as a moment to say, ha ha, it's not true. So he got up front and said, okay, everyone, go home. Nothing's happening today. And just as he announced those words, boom, the skies rolled back. The dark clouds rolled back and the sun was seen shining in its strength. The, the cloud descended from heaven. A bright flash of light came raining down from the heavens. The storm stopped and the sun was as pale as the nighttime moon. Mary spoke, or the apparition spoke to the children for a moment, and then she began to ascend back into the sky. And she lifted her hands, and as she lifted her hands, the children say, Joseph, holding a baby Jesus, appeared to the right of the sun. The crowds did not see this apparition. They did not see Mary. They saw the cloud. They saw the light. They saw the, the storm stop. They saw the clouds open, but they did not see this apparition. But Joseph is said to have stood by the right side of the moon. Mary hovered by the left side of the moon. And baby Jesus and Joseph did the sign of the cross. And things were glorified. The children's clothes even changed. The crowd saw this. A light came down, hovered over the children, and their clothes were shining in the brightness and glory of heaven, they claim, they say. Here's what one witness uh, to what happened says. The sun cast different colors, yellow, blue, and white. It trembled constantly. It shook. It looked like a revolving ball of fire falling upon the people. As the sun hurled itself towards the earth in a mighty zigzag motion, the multitude cried out in terror, I, Jesus, we're all going to die. I, Jesus, we're all going to die. Some begged for mercy. Our Lady, save us. Many others made acts of contrition or uh, repentance. One lady, one lady was even confessing her sins out loud. Everyone gave a sigh of, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped the line. At last, the sun swerved back to its orbit and rested in the sky. Everyone gave a sigh of relief. We were still alive and the miracle promised by the children had come to pass. 70,000 witnesses. To this day, the only ones who ever spoke out against this, who claimed it was not true, were people who were not there. The whole crowd had the same story of what took place. No one there claims, nope, nothing happened, we're all lying. Everyone said this took place place. Just as this spirit had promised, a miracle attended the apparition in October on the 13th. But also, just as the spirit had promised, shortly after, in the next two to three years, both Jacinto and Francisco died young. But Lucia, just as the spirit had promised, lived until the year 2005. As we read that witness's account, I hope, if, you've, if you heard part four, we talked about the deceptions coming in the sky, I hope that your prophetic goggles are on and they're flashing and you're going, oh wow, that is a, um, pr that is a fulfillment of the prophecies of Revelation. Fire falling from the sky. Do you remember that from Revelation chapter 13? The promise that these powers would have fire fall from the sky. That there would be signs in the sky. 
Fatima is certainly a part of that deception. It's an early, you know, 1917 Fatima. We talked about the Lateran Treaty last week, how Italy handed the land, the Vatican, back over to the church. Happens in 1929, and it puts us on that path to the healing of the wound. These things happened together or in a, chronologically for a reason. The people saw fire fall from the sky, and soon the wound was healing. Fatima is certainly a part of that deception, but at some point, don't forget, the Spirit also promised that a seventh would take place, a seventh time in which this apparition would occur. The events of that day and the apparitions prior to October have been debated, but by no one who was there. They all claim to have seen these things. So I guess maybe I should be clear if I haven't been clear enough. I, while I strongly reject that these happenings were divine from God, I have no reason this morning to say that they did not happen, that they were a figment of their imagination. These things happened. These things were supernatural. But just because they're supernatural, does that mean it's from God? This is what we've learned in this series, right? Supernatural powers happen, but just because they're supernatural does not mean it's from God. We went through in part four a long list of things that had happened in Scripture and the prophecies of Scripture of the supernatural miracles and things that Satan can also do. And he does them as an angel of light, right? He does it under the guise of divine things, but that doesn't mean it's divine. In light of Bible prophecy, this event is exactly what we've been warned about. And I have a bad feeling about this, that we're getting ready for the seventh apparition. First of all, let's break from that for a moment and head back to seeing this in Scripture. Seeing that, that in the times we've been comparing what's happening today to what happened in First and Second Kings. How we're seeing the rise of Babylon today is exactly what happened in the rise of Babylon the first time. Uh, during this time of the divided kingdoms of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, we are told that one of the chief sins of God's people was the sin of witchcraft. Child sacrifice, which we've discussed, divination, consultations with mediums and spirits all fall into this category. There's a story in 2 Kings, though, where a wicked king, Jeram, is, um, is, is trying to bring a lot of witchcraft into Israel, and he's trying to spread it into Judah, the southern kingdom. He's trying to bring, he is the grandson of Jezebel. And Jezebel's crime, Jezebel's sin, was the sin of witchcraft being brought into Israel. Now, I want you to notice this story. He's going to get called out. Elisha, the prophet, anoints Jehu, the new king. He says, Joram is wicked and evil. We can't have him as king anymore. So he sets Jehu up as king. But I want you to catch a discussion between Jehu and Joram that will fit into this story that we're studying. 2 Kings chapter 9. It'll fit into our current news. It'll fit into the Fatima news. 2 Kings chapter 9. Joram gets news that Jehu is on his way. We're going to read several verses here. They're short, don't worry. Starting at verse 17. We're going to notice several verses, and I want you to catch. Here as we read, I want you to catch the focus for Joram. What does he care about? What is the only thing Joram, the wicked king, cares about? Catch this. 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 17. We're going to read into verse 22, starting at verse 17. 2 Kings 9 says this, Now a watchman stood on the tower in Jezreel, and he saw the company of Jehu as he came, and said to Joram, I see a company of men. And Joram said, Get a horseman, and send him to meet him, and let him say, What, everyone? Is it peace? Keep reading. Verse 18, so the horseman went to meet him and said, thus says the king, is it peace? 
And Jehu said, what have you to do with peace? Turn around and follow me. So the watchman reported saying, the messenger went to them, but is not coming back. Verse 19, then he sent out a second horseman who came and, and said, thus says the king, what? Is it peace? And Jehu answered, what have you to do with peace? Turn around and follow me. So the watchman reported saying, he went up to them and it's not coming back. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. Verse 21, then Joram said, make ready. And his chariot was made ready. Then Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot, and they went out to meet Jehu. They met him on the property of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Now it happened when Joram saw Jehu that he said, what? Is it peace? Okay, pause there. We'll finish the verse in a second. What is Joram focused on? Peace. Hey, 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 slow down there, buddy. Hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's work this out. Let's work together. Let's look for peace together. A wicked king and a righteous king. And the wicked king is inviting the righteous king to peace. Hey, let's have peace. Relax. Calm down. Let's have peace. You know, this is, a, this is going to be a difficult battle for Adventists in the last days. The world will be desiring peace, calling for peace, signing treaties for peace. Are we against peace? We're not against peace. So as we say, no, don't do this. Don't follow that. Our message is what? Don't have peace. Don't follow peace. That puts us in a predicament. We want peace. We believe in peace. How do you speak out against peace? But we're really standing out. We're speaking out against how to accomplish the peace. Jehu's not against peace, everyone. Let's finish the verse. Notice what he's, he's not against peace. Let's, uh, we'll start verse 22 again. So we're all on the same spot. Now it happened when Joram sent Jehu that he said, is it peace, Jehu? So Jehu answered, what peace? As long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many. Does Jehu speak out against peace? No, he says you can't have peace. What peace as long as the witchcraft of your grandmother, your mother, Jezebel, stands firm? Jehu was not speaking against peace. He'd be fine with peace, but peace the right way. Peace through their God. Peace through the word of God. It would be a predicament for us as we stand out against these principles that the world is teaching. Look at those people. They don't want to stand united with us. They don't want to be one with us. They don't want the peace that we are struggling for together. And our message won't be, no, don't have peace, have war. That's not our message. Our message will be, find peace in Jesus. Find peace in Jesus. The witchcraft. The apparitions of Fatima. What was the message? Have peace. But how do you have that peace? What were the directions? If you follow my directions, if you follow my immaculate heart, I will grant you peace. It's the same message here in 2 Kings. Practice the unrighteousness. Practice the witchcraft of Jezebel as long as we all get along. But the messenger of the Lord says we can have peace but only if we turn away from witchcraft. Only if we forget and let go of the sins and the rebellion and the unrighteousness in Israel. We can find peace in God. Amen. Only through God. Amen. There is no peace without revival. Shortly after this, Joram flees and he's killed. He dies. He refuses to turn from his wicked ways, specifically the ways of witchcraft. Let's not forget the warning of Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He tells us that the lawmakers of the world will be proclaiming peace and, who remembers, safety. But sudden destruction comes upon them. Why? Because there's no peace without revival. You want to make that practical? That is true for our marriages. That is true for our relationships with our children. 
That is true for the church. That is true for our neighborhood. It's true for our community. There is no real peace without revival. Because in our marriages, we know we all practice this. We're just not getting along. We're just going to huff and puff and not talk to each other for a while. And then a few days go by and you forget what you're mad about. And then you go back to normal. But what? That thing's still eating away at our hearts, right? It's still, that annoyance is still on us. There was no true revival. We just forgot about it. This is what the world is saying. Don't bring righteousness. Don't bring revival. Follow our directions and we will bring peace. We're told the same thing will occur in Revelation, in the book of Revelation. Jesus tells the church in chapter 2 that he hates that they have adopted the theology, the witchcraft of Jezebel. And in the last days, there will be a revival of witchcraft. Mediums and spiritists. Just read an article two weeks ago. The fastest growing religion in the United States used to be Protestant Christianity, Used to be um, specifically one and two were Adventism and Mormonism, but now the fastest growing religion in the United States, Spiritism. No shock, no surprise there, because prophecy declared that Spiritism would be key in the last days. At Fatima, not only was that a deception, but a coming seventh apparition will be a deception as well. I believe that that seventh apparition will come. What I'm about to read to you is so fresh. I just saw it last night. It's still on my phone. I didn't even get it into my notes. I had the thought last night as I was laying in bed, I wonder what the church, the Catholic church says about this seventh apparition. I read an article by a um, renowned uh, Catholic scholar named Richard Salbato. He says this, this, this should put goosebumps on your arms, everybody. He gives a couple of expectations, things we should expect to happen from the seventh apparition when it occurs. I'll just read a couple of them. Expect a seventh appearance of Our Lady of Fatima as part of the method of bringing about worldwide peace. Number two, expect the world to understand that the peace came from her immaculate heart. Number three, expect this to happen when all seems lost. Look around the world. Does all seem lost? It all seems lost. Like, how are we going to fix all this, right? How, anyone here have an have a idea of how to fix Republican and Democrat debates and discussions and arguments? How to fix this divide right now? How to fix No, I don't know. All seems lost. Uh, the next one, expect no seer. In other words, no prophet. No prophet will deem what this is. Expect no seer, but just Our Lady appearing to a large multitude of people on one of her feast days. He continues, expect her to come in answer to the Holy Father's prayers. The next one, expect her appearance. Here we go. Expect her appearance to convert most of the Christian world back to the Catholic faith. Revelation 13 say that's going to happen, that the wound will heal and people will convert back. I like, though, that it says most, because I won't. I, hope, I pray we won't. I know we won't. Most, though, he deems, will come back to the Catholic faith. And then, lastly, expect unity of all Christians sometimes after this event. In other words, if you don't give in to that unity, you aren't a Christian. Because everyone who comes back will be a Christian and a Christian of the Catholic faith, he's saying. They're teaching us, the world, what to expect is it then our diligence to also teach what to expect? I pray you understand that and, 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 and gleam that and, and grant that, that it's our job, our responsibility, if we know the truth, to also teach the world what to expect and what it means prophetically. Here's what Great Controversy says. Will an apparition take place? Great Controversy, page 557. The apostles 
as personated by these lying spirits, are made to contradict what they wrote at the dictation of the Holy Spirit when on earth. They deny the divine origin of the Bible and thus tear away the foundation of the Christian's hope and put out the light that reveals the way to heaven. That vocabulary there, the word she uses, sounds just like Fatima. That they'll deny the true light that leads to heaven. Is Fatima all about light? And leading us to her immaculate heart. Not to heaven, but to her immaculate heart. The apostles will be impersonated by lying spirits. These type of events will take place. So, last week, at the end of part five, we discussed the global compact on education. We asked ourselves a very important question. Why did they choose May 14 of 2020? All the other dates are lining up with the investiture controversy. They're lining up with the healing of the wound over time. All these items and places are all picked by the church, and they all line up. Why May 14th then for this meeting? It was announced back October 31st of 2018. Remember that? Why wait a whole year and a half? Here, they had the pact. They had the people who wanted to sign it. So why not sign it then? Why wait a year and a half? So as we've been doing in this series, of course, I searched through history of what took place on May 14th. Why May 14th? And here's what I discovered. Nothing. Nothing on May 14th. Almost shockingly, nothing in Christian history, nothing in church history has happened on May 14th. But why then did they choose May 14th? So then I thought, okay, nothing happened on that day. Maybe there's something that happened that week or something that included the 14th. Maybe a couple of days. And this is when I discovered that Fatima is being celebrated in 2020 from May 13th through May 17. And then I started to look at the story of Fatima and those dots that we've been connecting continued to connect. In fact, it's connecting so much, I'm ready to say that Fatima is the lines. It's the ink that's connecting the dots. It's the glue that's bringing it all together. It's the origin of the healing of the wound. And from Fatima, we're seeing things take place. It is the genesis of the healing of the wound. The apparitions of Fatima, 1917, were focused on the 13th day of each month, and it lifted the eyes of its witnesses to the sky. A warning of Revelation 13 that fire would fall from heaven. 70,000 people claim to have seen the message in the sky. The Global Compact on Education, May 14th, 2020. Let me leave you with this question. I'm not making a guarantee. I have no idea, but we're trying to connect some dots. What would happen at the Global Compact of Education on May 14th if something took place the day before? If the seventh apparition of Mary was to take place? Listen, be, let me be very clear on this. I'm not asking you to necessarily change anything. I'm not asking you to sell your properties, sell your cars. I'm not asking you to give all now to the church. I'm not asking us to necessarily make any, any changes. I've made plans for 2020, personal plans. I have a vacation in June that we're planning. We have church plans in 2020. I mean, hello, our ice cream social, our big fundraiser for our school is on May 14th of 2020. So I'm not saying, oh, here it is, give it all away, stop your plans, run to the mountains. But if something was to take place, and I believe it's going to take place, great controversy, great controversy says it's going to take place at some time. So it's going to happen at some point. Here's what we need to know today. Here's what you and I need to know. We're going to wrap up with one more verse. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus specifically warns us about this day. When these sightings take place, he gives us instructions of what to do. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 26. Jesus tells us exactly what to do if the, when these things happen. When these sightings and miracles take place, he tells us how to handle it. Matthew chapter 24, verse 26. 
Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. I want to remind you what happened when Eve went to the tree in curiosity. Did that go well for her or for us? I want to remind you what happened to Balaam, a prophet of God who was told not to follow the servants of Balak, but he followed after them anywhere, anyway, in curiosity. Did it end well for him or for Israel? No, it did not. Think about the men who went to the tree to make fun of the children at Fatima. They wound up believers. We already know that it will happen someday, whenever that takes place. But when it happens, what is the church supposed to do? Don't look. Don't go looking for it. Don't go, don't go trying to find it. Don't YouTube it. Don't Google it. Don't go to it. Why? Curiosity, what does it do to the cat? Kills the cat. Do we already know these things are going to happen? Should we be shocked when they take place? No, we know they're going to take place. Instead of going and looking at that, what should we go and look into? The Word of God. To see Jesus in the Word, right? Keep our eyes focused on Jesus. The reason I decided to present a warning of that these things are going to happen someday, and maybe it's going to happen in May, is this point. When it happens, keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't go looking. Don't go wondering. Don't be curious. We already know it's going to be bright and beautiful. We already know it's going to blow our minds and our senses. We already know it's going to be the most beautiful thing we've ever seen. We know it's an angel of light and beauty, right? We know these things. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. Don't go look. But do have this. Have an answer. Be prepared to speak. When your loved ones or your family or your, um, and your family or your neighbors, your coworkers, when they say, oh, did you see what happened? Have an answer. Be prepared to speak. Be prepared to say, yes, and here's why. Have these things in your heart. Your word, O oh Lord, I have hidden where? In my heart that I may not sin against you. Have an answer and be prepared. Be ready to speak to be ready to keep people focused on Jesus. Read his word. As we transition now from what's happening in Rome to what's happening in America, we're going to notice the connections to Fatima. The things that took place at Fatima connect clearly to American politics today and also to Islam. We're going to be noticing those in the next part of our series. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Amen. Study his word. Study his word. Commit these ideas and these thoughts, this theology to your heart. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your warnings. The whole soul purpose, the reason they exist, so that we can clearly identify Christ in the deceptive moment, movements of Antichrist. We want to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Help us do so now. Nothing's happening right now. It's, you know, no apparitions taking place. We're safe and secure. So Lord, in this time of peace of our hearts, help us focus on your word. Lord, I know I'm not alone here either. I have trouble with my memory. I have trouble trying to memorize things. Father, pour out your spirit on us. Help us to memorize your scripture. Keep it close to our hearts, close to our tongue. So that when these things take place, five months from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, when they take place, we will be able and ready to speak and to glorify your pure heart. In Jesus' precious name, amen.